Hello guys, welcome to my channel. I am Dr. Shubham and today we are going to discuss a very important topic that is atrial fibrillation. It is a most common type of a sustained cardiac arrhythmia. Most important risk factor is the increasing age. In India, it is seen most commonly in female post-traumatic heart disease and at least a decade younger the western age group in men, hypertensive, risk factors and also in the older patients. Now we have five types of atrial fibrillation. One is a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where, where the, uh, it spontaneously terminates within, uh, within or, or within less than seven days and it, it has a ectopic focus and most commonly with the pulmonary veins. Then we have a persistent atrial fibrillation which is reverted after seven days with cardioversion or a pharmacological st strategy and may have a recurrent paroxysmal AF as well and there is no ectopic focus related to it. Then we have a long-standing atrial fibrillation which stays for more than 12 months and here more than rate rhythm is important. You have to control the rhythm first. Then is a permanent AF which is always the patient will always stay in atrial fibrillation and in this there is no role of a uh, rhythm control strategy. Then we have a subclinical atrial fibrillation that is only seen in a patient with intracardiac, implantable or a wearable monitors. It is also associated with high risk, high risk of stroke, high risk of TIA, heart failure and usually the subclinical AF has a poor prognosis. What are the risk factors with no structural heart disease and a structural heart disease? With a structural heart disease, you know the LVH, systemic hypertension, ischemic heart disease, hypertrophic dilated cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, amyloidosis, cardiac tumors, HOCM, DCMP, and with a non-structural heart disease with the advancing age, obesity, sleep apnea, uh, chronic alcoholism, and thyrotoxicosis. What is the consequence of AF? So these are the consequences. It can lead to a thromboembolism. There is 4.5 times increased risk of thromboembolism and it is related with two times more risk of mortality. It is due to heart failure and a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Impaired hemodynamics can be there which can lead to heart failure and it is two to three times increased risk of hospitalization and reducing the quality of life. Next, we have ECG changes. We all know, but we will uh, dig little deeper. Uh, there will be fibrillatory waves. There will be absence of P waves and the heart rate will be 350 to 600 beats per minute. Now, how you will differentiate whether it is an old AF or a new AF? So look at those F waves, those fibrillatory waves. If those F waves are uh, the cause, it is cause and it is more than 2 mm, then it is a new onset AF. And if it is fine F waves with less than 1 mm, it is an old AF with LA fibrosis and remodeling. What are the uncommon findings which we usually do not see or we misinterpret it? Regular wide QRS tachycardia. So, for example, you see a wide QRS tachycardia. So, you are like, okay, fine, it is a broad complex, uh, broad QRS tachycardia. So, it is towards VTAP. No, it is not the case. You have to look again into it. If V2 develops over AF, ventricular pacing post ablation of AV node. Ventricular escape rhythm comes in AF. Then there can also be a regular narrow complex QRS tachycardia if junctional escape is in, in AF with a complete heart block. So this is an ECG or it's a normal ECG with a uh, not a normal ECG but it's related to AFib and you can see a irregular RR interval which is making a clear cut diagnosis of a AFib and you can see the heart rate. How you will manage the acute case of AF coming to you in an emergency? First of all, you have to see that either the patient is stable, hemodynamically stable, or he is unstable. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, uh, directly go for a transthoracic cardioversion. So you have to put two pads anterior laterally. That is one you have to place in front, and one you have to place at the rear. And if the patient, and you have to give a cardioversion, you have to give a shock to the patient. How much? So it is simply said that if the patient is unstable, if the patient is in shock, you have to give the patient a shock. So first of all, you have to give 150 to 200 joules of shock. If not reverted, you have to give 360 joule of uh, shock and followed by a IV delight. So if the patient is hemodynamically stable and he has come to you within uh, less than 48 hours, so it is preferred to go for the early cardioversion 
it gives a rapid release there, there is no transies of agent eco required there is no prior anti coagulation required and it has a less recurrence rate now you gave the uh, cardio version now is uh, for the pharmacological therapy parenteral pharmacological therapy you have to give patient ibutylide procanamide amiodarone and for the oral it is propofenone and flaconide okay, uh, and if it is a electrical cardio version you have started from a 120 to 200 joules if it fails you have to give a ibutylide infusion and if it is recurring so there is no role of ibutylide as such so you can see uh, if it is recurring so it depends upon the duration and there is no role of short right now the next thing that we need to see is a late cardio version if the patient has come after 48 hours so you cannot cardio over the patient so you have to look at the duration of AF usually it is not clear the patient doesn't know thrombus is there in the left atrium so there is a much much role of transesophageal eco correctable cause like such as hyperthyroidism so for such patients first you have to give anticoagulation for 3 weeks before cardio version then you have to again give anticoagulation for next Four weeks after coagulation. So remember, three weeks for anticoagulation. Then I, the patient, will cardio ward. Then I, the patient, will next four weeks. For anticoagulation, then I. In cases, me, you will rate control. 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 In cases, me, and patient preference also you have to see favors the rhythm control the patient's age is less than 65 years he is more symptomatic he is having a paroxysmal AF it's a uh, first episode of AF there is no hypertension no previous rhythm control he, she is a female they, they have a history of congestive heart failure right now we follow the pill in the pocket therapy what is this pill in the pocket therapy uh, the patient uh, who is having a recurrent AF and he is uh, he knows that he is a case of AF fibrillation he should always have a short acting beta blocker in his pocket such as propranolol or a calcium channel blocker by the pommel for weight control so uh, with a minimal structural heart disease definitely it is called pill in the pocket approach what is a non-pharmacological therapy for the management of atrial fibrillation for the, uh, the radio frequency ablation definitely for the rate control AV nodal ablation and pacing and partial AV nodal ablation for rhythm control you have to give a osteal ablation and a wide AV ablation and we also go for the maze procedure in such patients now the very very important part of this is the chart VASC 2 score so what is this chart VASC 2 score it, uh, one point is given for each for congestive heart failure 1 point H hypertension 1 point age more than 65 years 1 point diabetes 1 point history of stroke if it is embolic or ischemic 2 points vascular peripheral vascular disease 1 point age more than 75 years 1 point and sex female gender 1 point so this is how you give one one point to each except stroke and you calculate a chart was to score so uh, the low risk when the score is 0 you do not need any antithrombotic therapy when the score is 1 it is a moderate risk you can put the patient on aspirin alone or anticoagulation with warfarin or a newer anticoagulant NOAC if the patient have high risk that is the score is more than 2 plus you have to put the patient on a full anticoagulation with warfarin and maintain the INR between 2 to 3 Additional indications of full anticoagulation one is chart was 2 score uh, plus 2 ka score hai, you have to give a full anticoagulation you have a previous mechanical heart wall previous thromboembolism rheumatic mitral stenosis or hokum hypertrophic cardiomyopathy now there are some newer oral anticoagulants which has to be discussed very very importantly for uh, uh, AFib Dabigatran you have to give 130 mg twice daily if creatinine clearance is more than 30 ml per minute and reduce the dose to half if creatinine clearance is less than 30 ml per minute. Levaroxabin you have to give 20 mg once daily in the with the evening meal if the creatinine clearance is more than 50 ml per minute. Reduce the dose to 15 mg if the creatinine clearance is between 15 to 50 ml per minute. Ab6 you have to give 5 mg twice daily 
and reduce the dose to half if the patient has any of the three factors that is age more than 80 years a serum crit more than 1.5 and he has a body weight more and increased bmi you have to reduce the dose to half etoxamine uh, 60 mg once daily if the creatinine clearance is 50 to 95 30 mg if the creatinine clearance is uh, 15 to 50 and do not use if the creatinine clearance is more than 95 ml per minute so you have novax you have dabigatran rivaroxaban abisixaban and etoxaban fine now the next thing you should know is this uh, uh, thing there is a ecg we all can see and in ecg you can see there are long cycles preceding the cycle terminated by the aberrant qrs complex fine so you look at the arrows there is a rbb form aberrancy with a normal orientation of initial qrs factor but you can see the irregular heart rate irregular coupling and lack of fully compensatory pause so such a phenomena is known as a ashman phenomena fine so uh, this is uh, what we have discussed about a uh, atrial fibrillation in short so in uh, supraventricular tachycardia especially when you are discussing about uh, atrial fibrillation i also want to discuss two more drugs over here one three actually one is diltiazem one is metoprolol and the third one is a verapamil drug of choice you usually give a metoprolol uh, 2.5 to 5 mg iv bolus over 2 minutes and repeat every 15 minutes at the maximum dose of 15 mg you have to be very careful for the hypotension heart failure bronchospasm and bradycardia uh, and it is contraindicated in heart failure asthma copd and av nodal dysfunction what uh, we are more comfortable in using is a diltiazem 0.25 mg kg per kg iv bolus over 2 minutes repeat after 2 minutes 0.35 mg per kg over 2 minutes after 15 minutes followed by infusion of 5 to 10 mg per hour and increase up to 15 mg per hour but again you have to be very careful about heart failure wpw and just keep a check on the heart rate uh, and blood pressure sbp especially when you are giving diltiazem third verapamil we give a bolus of 5 to 10 mg iv bolus over 2 minutes and additional 10 mg after every 15 to 30 minutes of the initial dose if there is no response so this i have discussed atrial fibrillation in short thank you